Uh, so I'm Gerhard Mundinger, uh, and the MBA here at the Crane Center. The purpose of this video is to relay all of the bad things and the good things that can happen with facial feminization surgery. So facial feminization is obviously a very broad topic. Um, I break it up into bony work and soft tissue work. So I'm going to go through, to start, um, the bony work based on skeletal facial thirds, talking about all of the things that I think patients need to think about when considering whether or not they want to move forward with specific procedures. Obviously the purpose of this video is to make sure that you as a patient have all the information from the surgeon's perspective so that you can make a good informed decision about what you want for your body. So starting with the upper facial third, um, and obviously even though I break things up into bony work and soft tissue work, they overlap. Um, the first consideration I think for patients is with any work on the forehead, obviously I need to make an incision in your scalp. What type of incision do you want in your scalp? And there's basically two options. The first option is to make the incision and keep it completely concealed within the hairline. So with that, the incision starts in the hairline just behind one ear, goes over to the other ear. I peel all the soft tissues down in your face and I'm looking at the bones here, which is the area of interest to reduce. With that incision, the benefits are the incision is completely concealed in the hairline. It does not give the ability to change the distance from the eyebrow to the front of the hairline. The other option is if you want your hairline advanced to start the incision in the same place, but jog it forward, typically to reduce areas of temporal hollowing. So the incision ends up just behind the hairline across the visible portion of your forehead. There are two big drawbacks to that. One is the incision itself you do not realize how much people look at this part of your face until you have an incision that is there that is going through its expected healing phases, which really lasts a full year. So at minimum, you have to deal with that for a full year. I think for whatever reason, that incision, in contrast to all the other incisions we're gonna talk about today, does not behave as well as other incisions. And there's more tension on your forehead. I would say in about 10 to 15% of people, that incision just does not heal well. So that's consideration number one. Consideration number two is innervation to the scalp. There's a watershed area that I try to hit right when I'm making that more posterior incision. You have innervation coming out here that innervates the front part of your scalp. You have innervation coming out here that innervates the back part of your scalp and they meet at an area roughly where I try to place that more posterior incision. Don't always get that right. Sometimes there's some numbness around that incision, but it tends to be very manageable. When you use the second option for hairline advancement with the incision coming farther forward, you're prematurely cutting that anterior innervation and you will end up with an area, typically three to four centimeters of your central scalp that is permanently numb. Some people can tolerate this well, other people cannot. Imagine every time that you brush your hair, you're bumping this area of numb skin and that, that tends to be permanent. So. Those are the two big considerations with that anterior incision. Everything in plastic surgery is cost benefit. If the benefit to having your hairline look more feminine outweighs the cost of potentially having a bad scar or having an area of permanent numbness, then that decision may be the appropriate one for you. So that's kind of the two, the two hairline incisions for accessing the forehead. Um, once I've made the incision, I typically work on the bones of the forehead. I always use a burr that kind of grinds down masculine, more prominent bone on the upper orbit and over the frontal sinus. If I like to, if, if I can, I always like to, based on your CT scan, I then cut off the outer surface of your frontal sinus, the anterior table. I reshape it and then recess it farther back. Um, I have to affix it with plates and screws and occasionally sometimes mesh. This part of your skeleton is not a good area to have permanent hardware. And the reason for that, we know from the trauma literature that the thinness of this bone can lead to resorption of the bone over the course of 15 to 20 years. If that happens, the reconstruction for that is very involved. It involves taking bone from the back part of your scalp and using it to recreate the anterior table of the frontal sinus, or in some cases can actually involve free tissue transfer 
typically with a piece of your fibula bone that we need to use to, to fill in that space in the frontal sinus. I have not seen that yet in patients in my practice. I imagine that I will. Um, I've done that procedure many times, but it, it, it's very involved um, and can be very, very challenging. It's a very big to do, very involved surgery anytime you use microsurgery. It is more common for the plates and screws in that area to loosen and need to be taken out in time. Again, that's still very rare. I would say five to 10% of patients, if you look at them throughout their lifespan after this procedure. So bony resorption is a potential issue. Loosening of hardware is a potential issue. There's also the possibility I could damage one of the nerves where they come out of the upper eye socket. Although I'm looking at those nerves throughout the whole case and have never knowingly damaged one um, if I did, I would be able to fix it at the time of injury. Another issue that I talk to all patients about when operating around the eye sockets is damage to the internal contents of the eye socket itself. There is absolutely a risk of permanent partial or total vision loss anytime you operate around the eye socket. That risk is way, way, way less than a fraction of a percent, but it's not zero and it is a risk that as a patient, you just have to accept that I'm gonna do the best job that I can, but I can't make that risk zero, no matter how careful I am. Um, so those are really kind of the, the three big considerations on the upper third of the orbits. Damage to that nerve, resorption of the frontal sinus bone, again, both very, very rare, and then potentially devastating complication of having permanent vision loss. It is also possible that your eyes become unyoked. There are six muscles on either eye that yoke together to allow us to see in stereoscopic vision. It's very common after surgery that because of the swelling inside the eye socket, those eyes become unyoked um, and you have transient double vision. Very common to have transient double vision, very common to feel like your eyes are fatigued for a few months after surgery. Um, typically that goes away also very common to have numbness on your scalp just from the stretching from their tractors to be able to do the work again very commonly that goes away and it's not a problem long term and it, it needs to be said any region of the face that I operate on the swelling after the surgery can be profound um, typically the swelling starts the second day after surgery peaks at about two days after surgery um, and then rapidly comes down that initial swelling wave, but there's a lot of residual swelling, particularly in the lower face, which I'll get to, that sticks around for months and we just have to wait out. Um, typically patients come out of surgery and notice the changes in their forehead. Um, they feel like they're not that swollen, they're not in a lot of pain. Typically the second day after surgery is when that peaks and typically the second day is, is the roughest. Um, it's very common to have your eyes swell shut. It's very common to have bruising around your eye sockets and on your forehead. Um, again, that's all expected par for the course. Um, it is also, well, it can happen too that you have hair loss along your incisions in the forehead. Um, I've also had patients who've had kind of paradoxical hair thinning on the scalp just from the dissection to, to do the bony work as well. Typically that resolves in time, but may need medications to help. With every forehead procedure, I use devices called endotines that are made out of a resorbable material. They get drilled into the skull just behind the hairline and they have flanges that either come forward or backward, depending if you have your hairline advanced or if you have your brow raised. Those devices statically hold your scalp in position until it heals and re-scars down into your new bony anatomy. The devices are made to resorb at a year. While they're in place, they can be really annoying. You typically can't see them unless you have a lot of hairline recession, but you can absolutely feel them. Um, most common complaints when patients style their hair, that they feel the, the this bump on their forehead that, that can be painful. Um, the devices serve a really good purpose, which is to raise the brow up um, or to help with the hairline advancement if you have them placed forward or placed backward, depending upon what incision you choose for your forehead. It's just something you have to weigh out and remember that the devices are designed to resorb, but it can take a full year for that to happen. When they resorb, they typically swell. Um, most patients have gotten used to them by that time point. Sometimes you've forgotten they're actually there. 
when you get to that year time point where they're starting to resorb, they imbibe water and they swell, and it can be distressing for patients. You know, I get calls, what's happening? What's going on here? Oh, it's, it's okay, it's just your end of time, it's resorbing. Moving down to the mid-phase. The most common procedure in the mid-phase is rhinoplasty. Um, the rhinoplasty risks for facial feminization surgery are very congruous with rhinoplasty risks for patients who are not having rhinoplasty for facial feminization. The incision is typically across the base of your columella, which is visible. That incision tends to heal very well. The most common issues after rhinoplasty are, again, number one, expect a lot of swelling, particularly of the nasal tip. That can take a full year for that to completely go away. Typically, you're breathing after reduction rhinoplasty, which is the most common type of rhinoplasty for facial feminization surgery is better, but not always. There's a risk that there can be warping of cartilage grafts, feeling sutures underneath your skin. All the sutures I use are resorbable. Um, there could be a chance your breathing is made worse. Your septum could become more deviated after the procedure. All those things are, again, are very unlikely, but are a risk that you assume with any kind of rhinoplasty. The most common complaint I have after rhinoplasty is that there are subtle asymmetries that can be really bothersome to you as a patient, but that typically are not noticeable to others. Um, I like to see rhinoplasty patients long term because I want to look at my results in a year and I also want to be able to have the opportunity to, to touch up any areas that patients may be dissatisfied with. Um, most of the risks with rhinoplasty are specific to exactly what I'm going to be doing with your nose and are, are clearly things that I'll be going over with you when I see you and we actually talk about what rhinoplasty I recommend. Um, other common mid-phase procedures are placement of malar implants. Um, any implant anywhere in the body, this is true for you know hardware on the forehead, implants on the cheek, implants for genioplasty, breast implants. Anytime you put something that's not your body's own tissue that is made by human beings into your body, there is a risk long-term that there could be a problem with that implant. Most common things are nothing. The implants do fine. After that, low-grade infections that may need to be treated with antibiotics, loosening of screws that affix the, the cheek implants, forming of a capsule that can be painful around the implant, um, and in some cases the implants need to be taken out and either exchanged or just left out and we use other options to help increase the volume of your cheek. Um, lip lifts are also very common with facial feminization surgery. Um, they involve an incision just at the base of the nose to help reduce the height from the top of your lip to the base of your nose and help turn out the red portion of your lip. Typically that incision heals very well, but it, it can be visible in some cases at a conversational distance and need makeup to touch up. I think something that patients don't think about is if you have residual hair. Um, I didn't shave today, I've got my little you know hair follicles. You will notice a shift in your in your hairline if you haven't had complete hair removal that may need to be touched up afterward. And sometimes it can be annoying um, if you continue to shave with the orientation of the hair follicles because they are brought higher up closer to your nose. Some people have hair that's naturally there, other people don't. It just depends on where you have your facial hair or the extent to which you've had your facial hair removed. Um, moving down to the jawline, um, I commonly use a CT scan and make cutting guides and plan to shave off a strip of bone from angle to angle. Anytime you operate on the lower portion of the face, the jawline, the biggest issue with that is swelling. Um, all the swelling, and again, a lot of these procedures are done in combination, tends to pool at this portion of your face. It can take, again, up to a year for that swelling to completely go away. But the swelling tends to be most profound the farther down the face that you go, just because of the effect of gravity. The incisions I use to make those cuts on the chin, which is genioplasty, or to reduce the angles of the mandible, are all made through incisions inside the mouth. Typically those incisions heal well. Sometimes they can break open and need to be packed uh, or reclosed. And again, that's because your saliva is in your mouth. It tends to pool in dependent positions and it has a lot of bacteria. The big risks to operating on the jawline are your mental nerve. You have a nerve here and here that gives sensation to your lower lip and to your teeth. I'm looking at those nerves when I'm doing these procedures on the lower jaw. There is always a chance that one of those nerves could be permanently injured. 
Again, analogous to the nerves here on the forehead, I'm looking at the nerves throughout the procedure. If I damaged one and knew it, I would fix it at the time of surgery and the results from that repair are typically pretty good. Again, very common, almost invariably, to be numb on your lower lip on one side or both sides because of the retractors I need to use to make the cuts. And typically that numbness goes away in time, but it can be annoying to wait out. Sometimes it can cause drooling. Um, and sometimes there can be some asymmetry of your lip position after the procedure. Again, that's rare. Um, moving on down to thyroid cartilage reduction. Uh, the incision I use for that is the same incision I use for face facelifts and neck lifts. Um, it's about three to four centimeters, kind of in the shadow here that everybody has. Um, it tends to heal very well. The big risks for thyroid cartilage reduction are damage to your vocal cords, which I've never had happen in my practice, but could because I'm operating on the area very close to where your vocal cords insert. Um, the biggest thing I think with thyroid cartilage reduction is in the immediate post-operative period, if you get a collection of blood in the area where I'm working, it can compress your airway. So if you're at home recovering a day after surgery, two days after surgery, and all of a sudden you get this rapid swelling in your throat, I don't want you calling our office. I don't want you trying to get in touch with me. I want you to go to the nearest emergency room, tell them what procedure you've had done because the compression on your airway, your larynx can be that quick and it can be life-threatening. Again, super, super rare, but always possible anytime you operate in that part of the face. Um, fat grafting is very common, either with bony work on the face or with soft tissue work. The biggest complications from fat grafting are related to the nature of fat grafting itself. I'm taking fat from one part of your body, I'm putting it into another part of your body. There's always some associated swelling with that. There's always some long-term volume loss of the fat that's transferred. So it's very common to need to do fat grafting two, three, sometimes four times to get the volume correction that you desire. Patients typically like the swelling to augment the areas where the volume has been lost. It's always frustrating when that initial swelling comes down and then you get that initial resorption of the transferred fat. You feel like you've taken two steps forward and one step back, but that is, again, absolutely par for the course. About 50 to 60% of the fat that's transferred survives. And there can be complications from donor sites, which I talk about in another video. Um, buckle fat removal is also very common. Buckle fat removal is great to reduce the volume here, which helps accentuate your cheeks. The incision is very small. It's a very quick procedure. Um, there can be bleeding because there's a large vessel associated with a fat pad called the facial artery, the branches of the facial artery. Hematomas, which is a collection of blood there, are rare, but not unheard of. Um, and I would say the most common kind of long-term issue with buccal fat removal is taking too much buccal fat and feeling like your cheeks are too hollowed out. And again, there's this overlay of your point in your life when you have the surgery and just the natural aging of your face over decades. And sometimes you may feel you know, 20, 30 years down the road, depending upon what age you are when you have the surgery, that there's been too much volume loss. That can be corrected with fat grafting. Um, do you have any questions about stuff that I've talked about? Sometimes it's good if you just throw a question out and I can okay. respond to it. Um, no, not yet. Okay. Um, do, uh, actually, I do have one. Do you only do the shifting to the feminine or you do the other as well? Do the other as well. It's really okay. rare. Okay. Um, it's a lot easier in life, and this is unfair, but I think it's true, mm -hmm. to pass as a man in our society and sure. culture than just to pass as a woman. Sure. And there's actually good scientific data for that. Right. Um, the best studies are ones that show people a bunch of faces and they just say, is this a male face or is this a female face? Um, we have a very complicated, very deeply ingrained evolutionary loop in our brains that involves kind of lower cortical function and higher cortical function. Um, and it's based on anatomy. There's a very narrow window for facial features that read to another observer as female. The, you can think about it statistically. There's a, a median and a mean, mm -hmm. and there's variance on either side, standard deviation. Mm -hmm. That standard deviation window is very tight, mm -hmm. particularly for the forehead. Okay. Um, it turns out it's really not true for men. 
it's very easy to have a face that appears masculine to, to other people. And for that reason, facial mask conversation surgery is a lot less common. So for most patients who want facial feminization surgery, some degree of bony work is necessary for, for two purposes. Number one, to have your face look and be read as feminine by other people, you know, passing or not being clocked. The other reason to do facial feminization surgery is for your own personal perception of your face. And those two kind of circles obviously overlap to some extent, but they can be different for, for different people. Self-perception versus other people's perception. Most patients, as I said, need some degree of structural work to feminize the face. Depending upon your anatomy, where you are in life, how much facial aging you've had, and I hate to break it to you, your face will age. Gravity gets us all until we're six feet under, things sag, things droop. Until you have kind of the, the facial bony structure correct, a lot of the soft tissue work can't really be done at the same time until the bony work is, until the skeleton is in, in the right, right position. For younger patients, it's very common to be concerned about upper eyelid skin. Um, you really can't work on the upper eyelids until you've allowed the forehead work to heal because you're trying to hit a moving target when you're working on soft tissue until it's healed. Um, for older patients, a, a common concern is, is the face and the jawline. The way that is treated is typically with a facelift in combination with a neck lift. The incision for a neck lift is the same one I use to work on the thyroid cartilage. Sometimes that can be combined with thyroid cartilage work. The incision, as I mentioned previously, is about three to four centimeters in the under chin area. I typically remove a fat pad that's here, tighten up the platysma muscles, and then carry that dissection back, make an incision starting just above the ear, in front of the ear, behind the ear, down the hairline, and combine that with a facelift. Most common complications after a facelift are numbness of the earlobes, which can be permanent. Um, there's always a risk that you could damage the nerves that allow your face to animate. Um, the big nerves we think about are the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve, which can result in drooping or inability to smile. Damage to the zygomatic and buccal branches of a nerve, which allow for complete eye closure and allow for a complete symmetric smile. Permanent damage to those nerves is very rare, but can occur, and that's a risk that you're assuming with facelifting. The most common sensory change, as I mentioned, is earlobe numbness. There's a nerve that comes out here behind your sternocleidomastoid muscle that gives sensation to your earlobe in the lower third of your ear, sometimes to the skin on the angle of your jaw. Um, it's very common for the, to have transient numbness to those areas after facelifts. Um, of course, there's also the associated complications of bleeding. Um, it is very common in larger facelifts where I'm removing a lot of skin to have an area of skin that, that dies right behind the ear. That typically is treated just with dressing changes. We basically allow the skin to die and scar. It's hidden behind your ear and nobody can really see it unless they pull your ear forward or looking at a very specific angle from, from your side and kind of behind you. Um, timing of facelifting is important. Performing a facelift in a person in their mid-40s compared to performing a facelift on a patient in their mid-70s, there's obviously a difference in longevity of the facelift than somebody who's having it done in their mid-40s as compared to their 70s. Working on the eyelids, both upper and lower, is also very common. Um, as we age, we get extra skin on our upper eyelids. Um, we typically get puffiness on our lower lids, although we sometimes need to take out extra skin on the lower eyelids. Big things to worry about with eyelid surgery are kind of acute bleeding, which can necessitate a quick return to the operating room and can be vision threatening. Again, that's very rare. More commonly, there can be asymmetries that develop over time, and particularly for older patients, um, lid laxity, which can result in turning out of the eyelids or turning in of the eyelids that may be needed, may need to be managed with additional surgery. Most often, it's just managed with scar massage and the lid kind of responds over time, again, as you're going through the healing process um, and those soft tissues are remodeling after the surgery. Uh, typically with facelift surgery, I place drains that stay in for two to three days. 
Um, the same is true for forehead work on the scalp. I always place a drain that typically comes out concealed in the hairline. It needs to stay in for three to four days until you after you get through that initial period of, of peak swelling. Um, the drains can be painful, they can be annoying, but just remember they will come out at some point. <laughs> I, I've already kind of talked about options for moving the hairline forward. Mm -hmm. I've talked about some of the complications with the incisions for moving the hairline forward. I've talked about how trying to conceal the incision farther back in the scalp doesn't really change the relationship between your eyebrow and your hairline. The real answer for hairlines is hair transplantation. The issues with hair transplantation are that it's very expensive and it takes really a full year for you to really see the results from hair transplantation. The most common issues with hair transplantation are with the donor site. I typically take a strip of hair from back in the occipital region of the scalp. That scar can not heal well. Um, for trans women, typically who wear their hair longer, that scar can be concealed, but it, it may be bothersome when you comb your hair and, and when you do go back there and, and find it. Um, unless you cut your hair very short, it's typically well concealed, even if it doesn't heal well. With hair transplantation, all the grafts that are transplanted fall out two weeks to a month after surgery, and they can take a full year for the hair follicle to completely start growing again, which is one thing. Another thing is for the hair follicle, once it started, the hair shaft has started growing again to reach the length of hair that is the same with all your surrounding hair. So it can be a very long process for that transplanted hair to get to a, port, a, a point where you feel it is completely healed and is doing what it's supposed to do, which is feminize your hairline. Um, hair transplantation um, is done in the office uh, under some light sedation. Typically that goes very well. Uh, the biggest issue with hair transplantation analogous to fat grafting is that it does need to be done typically in, in two rounds. And there's a big time period between the first round and the second round, being sure that if we need to go back and do more transplantation of follicular units, that we're doing it in the right areas um, and that it's achieving your, your goal for how you want your hairline to look. The nice thing about hair transplantation is because it's being done in the office, it's kind of a partnership with where we design your hairline. We can look in a mirror, we can do it together, we can talk about wh what you want, what's realistic, what's feasible, what's not. Um, and you don't really have that luxury in the operating room. Thank you for watching this educational video on facial feminization surgery. Should you have any questions, please contact our office or visit us at craneCTS.com. Thank you.